Hello everyone, I'm Man Malachi from the Houston Methodist Hospital. Today we're going to continue our multimodality imaging conference and we're continuing with the theme of LA function hemodynamics. Um, I'll be presenting on CMR assessment and then Dr. Chang will present on uh, cardiac CT and nuclear cardiology assessment of LV function. So, uh, please, oh, let me say, uh, please go to polev.com uh, and enter Debakey uh, to ask your questions. And you can always text us, uh, text Debakey to 37607 and uh, text in your question. Okay, so um, I'll take the opportunity to discuss uh, some caveats in LV ejection fraction. You know, it's one of the most common questions we get asked in imaging labs, whether it's echo or MRI or others, what's the EF? Everyone wants to know what the EF is. But we always have to remember that there's a little bit more to cardiac function and ventricular uh, function um, than the EF. And I'll use some of the strengths of MRI to illustrate this. So here's a heart of a normal person without health, without any known disease. And and here's another heart that we happen to scan. Uh, to scan uh, the ejection fraction on the uh, person on the left was measured to be 65%, and we got the same ejection fraction from this uh, myocardium. However, if you notice, um, there's a little bit uh, of a difference between those two hearts. So the ejection, uh, the end diastolic volume was 164 uh, on the left. Whereas here, the heart was enlarged with an ADV of 259. And if you compute the stroke volume, uh, there's a significant difference in the stroke volume between those two hearts, despite having the same ejection fraction. Um, if you notice, this patient has a severe mitral regurgitation due to a flail of the posterior leaflet, and a lot of this uh, 168 stroke volume is actually going uh, backwards into the left atrium and thus it's not contributing in a meaningful fashion to forward stroke volume. So if you measure the independently assessed stroke volume out of the ascending aorta, both of these hearts actually end up with a similar uh, cardiac output, but obviously this one has enlarged significantly and we can't really say that those two hearts are the same uh, despite having the same EF. Uh, if you look at this heart, this heart is clearly severely depressed with a uh, wall motion abnormality in the LAD territory. Ejection fraction here is 23%. Uh, the heart is huge, uh, 434 mLs, and no significant MR, really uh, a trivial amount. But notice, he's actually maintaining the same forward stroke volume. So if you, you know, match these people for heart rate, vascular resistance, uh, pulmonary pressures, you know, at rest, they may have a similar um, cardiac output, but obviously with exercise, they'll be different. So the main message from this, you know, uh, discussion is to remember that ejection fraction as a numerical value doesn't necessarily always equate what the cardiac output is. It doesn't incorporate the LV size, and it's certainly uh, variable depending on the loading conditions. Uh, in terms of trying to assess contractility, there isn't really a perfect uh, measure, and we've sort of, you know, dependent on ejection fraction for the past, you know, 40, 50 years of cardiology because, uh, you know, many other uh, parameters were used, but, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to meet all of these conditions. Um, ideally, you want to be able to be um, something that you want to have something that's sensitive to changes in irotrophic independent of loading conditions, which is very, very difficult, uh, independent of size, and you want something that's easily and easily performed and safe and has prognostic value. So out of the multiple uh, proposed indices of LV function, the ejection fraction has really uh, survived uh, the best. Now, going back to MRI, um, MRI is pretty strong in the assessment of cardiac function due to multiple reasons. Uh, it's high Res spatial resolution, it's a high temporal resolution, uh, there's excellent signals to noise ratio, and you can image the heart in any plane that you want without having to de you know, depend on the patient's body habitus. So whether the person's BMI is 19 or 38, um, you can create the imaging planes and for the most part they won't really be affected. Uh, there's no need for geometric assumptions as well and um, we'll discuss briefly how it's actually performed. So in terms of MRI, it's not a complete uh, 3D data set that's acquired of the chest, at least in terms of these sequences. So what we create is imaging planes that begin uh, 
from a transaxial slice and we create um, a pseudo two chamber and a pseudo four chamber view uh, of the heart to try to emulate the echocardiographic windows. But we bisect these um, views perpendicular to the long axis of the heart and after we optimize these to ensure that we're at the true apex of the, um, the LV myocardium and we obtain multiple slices with a fixed uh, inner slice um, width and um, obviously we're going to end up with multiple uh, short axes uh, frames of the myocardium that cover the base of the heart all the way to the apex. Um, and then we can compute the end diastolic and end systolic volumes as we select which slice has the largest um, EDV and which one has the, lar the smallest volume which indicates the ESV and we use the modified uh, Simpson's rule uh, to compute the EF, the EDV and ESV. Um, there's been a discussion in the past about whether to include the papillary muscles within the LV mass versus including them within the LV volume. Um, the main consensus at this point is really to include them within uh, the LV mass because they contribute a significant portion to LV mass. And um, the critical thing is to really maintain consistency in your lab. So if you've done you know, one certain measurement uh, the same way for the previous 10 years, doesn't really make sense to change that, especially as many patients will require serial monitoring and you wanna maintain uh, consistency in your measurements. Um, as we trace um, these um, end diastolic and end systolic uh, frames, we notice that the heart actually uh, descends within the chest cavity and um, if you compare the exact same location within the same slice uh, at diastole versus systole, uh, the heart will descend down at systole and a portion of this will actually be, uh, here in this case will be in the LVOT, but as you go up you would have to adjust these and the strength of MRI is being able to match uh, each of the short axis sequences to a long axis reference point and you know with experience and doing this you know thousands of times you end up uh, uh, getting better at it. Um, so notice that I haven't really brought up gadolinium or contrast. So if you want to uh, assess EF, whether it's the LV or the RV, and assess ventricular function, uh, there's no need for uh, contrast use in this study. And this is really a 15-minute scan if you want an accurate EF measurement. Um, going back to assessment of um, uh, EF and ESV and EDV, really the validation has been very strong for MRI since the 80s. And this is a study that compared um, uh, cadaver hearts against a, a previously done uh, MRI and noticed that the interstudy reproducibility as well as the intra and inter observer variability are really excellent in the range of a few mLs and very few percentage points. So there's been really strong valid, very strong validation for MRI uh, assessment, uh, whether it's in animals or in vivo, uh, in vitro or ex vivo. Um, and this really has strong implications in terms of trial designs. Let's say you have a, uh, a, a procedure or a medication that uh, you really want to be able to assess if they result in any remodeling of the heart. Uh, really, MRI may be one of the best ways to reduce your sample volume um, and help with your power analyses because you're not going to have to do many patients with such an accurate technique. Now how it's actually performed in terms of MRI technique. Um, MRI calculates and uh, computes value in what's called the K-space. And the K-space is sort of a virtual uh, platform, if you will, or, or, or canvas where you collect data on frequency um, variables or frequency values. So as you scan the person with every RR interval, let's say you were, you're scanning the heart at diastole, um, you acquire a few K-space lines rather than a few uh, 
uh, slices of the heart or a few uh, portions of the uh, of the image. So each of the case-based lines, because it's frequency information rather than actual anatomical information, um, each of the lines contributes to the whole thing. And as you acquire uh, more case-based lines, you improve the spatial and and uh, resolute and you sp the spatial resolution of the image, and uh, you end up with more data. So um, as you complete um, the entirety of those lines, your image will improve um, in all of those avenues. Um, but to create a full cine, uh, like the videos that I showed you before, you have to acquire all of these uh, images uh, throughout the RR interval, and you create you know, anywhere between 25 to 30 images to create a good enough temporal resolution so you can visualize these and make inferences on cardiac function and wall motion. So um, we use a technique called segmentation where you acquire, acquire um, tr traditionally throughout a breath hold, uh, sp case space lines at each space in the RR interval, and you summate these case space lines to um, create um, the cine that you see on the top right. So we, with each of the frames, uh, you bend those frames to a certain portion of the RR interval and you end up with the movie. Um, in patients who are unable to hold their breath or they're in rapid AFib or the highly irregular RR interval, those create challenges for the traditional sequences, um, but there's always options of doing what we call real-time imaging. So real-time imaging is performed at a slight sacrifice in uh, temporal and spatial resolution, but you're acquiring the MRI in a way just like you're acquiring echo. So in real-time without any um, uh, processing that requires, you know, ac acquiring multiple heartbeats. So uh, the resolution, instead of being usually in the order of 1.5 to 2 millimeters, will be slightly higher, and the frame rate will be um, uh, slightly lower as well. But the benefit of this is also the patient just has to be able to lie flat, and you can also assess for paradoxical uh, septal interactions and changes in LV and RV uh, interactions with respiration. Uh, more recently, there's been more development, and this is really um, now has become almost standard of care, um, where there's multiple acceleration methods of acquiring imaging, and uh, this one in particular called compressed sensing uh, allows you to uh, capture the entire heart, so all of the 10, 12 slices that uh, we showed earlier in one uh, breath holds with uh, very good uh, frame rate, but it requires a little bit uh, longer in terms of processing time. So um, how do we uh, compare against echocardiographic measures? Um, there's already established normal values for CMR in terms of um, healthy adults. Um, usually the age range that was covered uh, with these studies in terms of adults has been really, you know, from the 20 years or so to the upper um, 80 years of age. And if you notice the ejection uh, fraction uh, values are fairly similar to echo, but the normal values for endosolic volume and endosolic volume are significantly larger than what they are on echo. And if you compare, for example, the uh, end diastolic volume range for, for men, the upper limit of normal here is 203 uh, versus 150 um, uh, for echo. And um, the index values will change uh, similarly. Now, another thing to remember is, um, and MRI has shown this very well, is that ventricular volumes slightly decrease with age, uh, whereas the ejection fraction, there may be a slight increase, particularly for women. And the normal values, as, as already known, are so quite significantly different between men and women, uh, including the index values. Ejection fraction is fairly similar uh, between um, contrast-enhanced echo uh, visual estimation of echo in good quality studies, and MRI, uh, where you see in this study that included pa patients with uh, low EF, normal EF, and moderately depressed EF, uh, had a pretty good uh, concordance in EF measurements. Um, the main study that looked at this, and now this is, um, you know, about a 13-year-old study, but it's, it's, it's highly relevant because it showed very well how um, 
uh, echocardiographic assessment, particularly with 3D echo, uh, differs with CMR assessment of volumes. And there is essentially an underestimation of EDV as well as ESV um, with echo, uh, also including 3D echo. Um, but the message is that now with newer 3D techniques as well as more experience, this uh, underestimation slightly uh, has, has improved and really it, it comes down to a case-by-case -case basis really. Uh, back in uh, those days, the acquisition of the data set took a while and the analysis took a while too, but really now it's a single heartbeat acquisition and uh, I think the concordance has gotten much better, but uh, there's still uh, an underestimation of echo versus MRI and that's really just a, a difference in technique, I would, I would argue. Um, in that study, um, they had a phantom that was actually 150 mLs um, as a known volume and uh, you notice as you try to trace that water balloon, just a slight deviation, whether it's to the edges of uh, the wall versus the outer edges, uh, you can get a very significant uh, change in your calculated volume versus a true volume. Um, and that's what they demonstrated here against MRI, where on echo, very often we're not seeing the trabeculations very well and we end up tracing uh, outside of the uh, trabeculations as compared to MRI. And um, the, I'll, I'll say, you know, when it comes to this is that the key thing to remember is that the volumes are going to be slightly higher on MRI, sometimes significantly higher, particularly as the uh, ventricles uh, get larger. You know, when you get to the 400, 500 cc ventricles, uh, it's not unusual at all to see, you know, 100 ml difference between echo assessment and MRI. Uh, the ejection fraction, for the most part, is fairly consistent. There's always going to be cases where uh, you get, you know, a 10, 15, uh, sometimes 20 percent uh, variation between the two studies, but um, uh, that may be more of a, uh, more explained by the, the adequacy of windows from echo and the visualization of the, the borders rather than uh, the true calculation in of itself. Uh, in terms of assessing LV function beyond the EF, uh, there's ways of assessing diastolic function by MRI, and really, um, I, I believe that this hasn't really caught on in terms of clinical practice, but uh, from a research standpoint, it certainly is um, something that many are working on. Uh, you can measure E and A velocities, uh, you can derive an E to A uh, prime uh, in, uh, an e to e prime ratio, and um, in terms of TR velocities, those are uh, challenging to measure by MRI. There's a good chance of underestimation of the true uh, TR velocities. There's other secondary um, measures of diastolic function, such as um, left atrial volume, uh, strain and torsion measurements, and uh, measures of uh, LA function, whether it's uh, strain or contractile function of the left atrium, um, as well as ECV, which uh, helps us infer the interstitial uh, expansion or the tissue compartments uh, characteristics of the LV, um, thus helping us with potentially inferring what the diastolic function of the LV is. Um, there's already established values for uh, some of these measures as well as the annular descent and there's data to support um, these in terms of prognosis. So in this study the assessment of the mitral annular systolic excursion by MRI uh, was shown to be uh, independently predictive of mortality in those uh, people. This, is, this happened to be a cohort of people with hypertension and having had an MRI for a clinical indication. And um, CMR tagging in terms of uh, assessment of strain, this is the classic, uh, you know, primary method of trying to assess uh, strain measures by MRI. Since then, there has been development of multiple other uh, methods, and more recently, really feature tracking has been uh, the main one uh, that's utilized at least primarily in research studies still. Uh, tagging has fallen out of favor a little bit, and um, in terms of feature tracking, it is also uh, well supported by uh, multiple research studies uh, in a variety of uh, conditions. This one here uh, is a study that looked at trying to differentiate constrictive uh, pericarditis versus restrictive cardiomyopathy using uh, CMR and uh, 
Um, I think for the most part it's still applied predominantly in research settings, uh, but there's certainly room for improvement. Um, as you notice in this study, for example, uh, GLS assessment by MRI was a powerful uh, predictor of mortality, uh, whether it was uh, the ischemic versus not ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. And this is independent of ejection fraction and LGE. So uh, it still holds and it still has value, just like an echo. Um, I think it, it probably needs a little bit of improvement in terms of ease of uh, application and um, supportive data of actual actionable, um, you know, things that you can do to the patient once you have uh, an abnormal LGE. There's de there's certainly room for I think research on this, particularly for example the. Uh, the cardio oncology applications, uh, early detection of infiltrative cardiomyopathies, genetic cardiomyopathies. So there's still, you know, huge room for improvement. So, um, and I kind of alluded to this already. Uh, the, the primary reason is uh, one out of the primary reason to mention is these these scans can unfortunately take longer than ideal, um, and in terms of throughput. Um, whether it's interpreting as well as performing these scans, there's, you know, uh, there's inherent challenges. Um, now, artificial intelligence, I will um, try to go over this uh, fairly quickly. There's really a revolution in AI, but it's been going on for 10, 15 years already. Um, we know that AI is very strong, um, particularly in applications like this, uh, and more particularly in, in, in the MRI space. Um, there's been, you know, continuous improvement in the inner observer, inter observer variability uh, for AI algorithms. And nowadays, even with commercial software, uh, there's huge um, improvements just between uh, the past two years where you can trace the entirety of the LV and RV with a single click, very often very accurately. Um, however, there's still going to be cases where you still have to go back to your basics and background training and uh, adjust these manually, uh, particularly in cases uh, such as congenital heart disease patients, um, significantly abnormal um, hearts, and uh, not so poorly, not so uh, well-defined borders or uh, cases with uh, in, with uh, cardiac devices or artifact. Um, I'll conclude by saying that uh, there's a lot of indications for MRI these days. Uh, really, any patient with heart failure or a new cardiomyopathy uh, nowadays uh, gets an MRI, and it's a very, very uh, useful test in terms of identifying etiology, um, identifying areas uh, that were potentially missed by a clinical or echocardiographic exam, um, accurate assessment for trying to determine uh, need for device therapies. Um, even more importantly are cases with infiltrative cardiomyopathy and restrictive cardiomyopathies. Um, and then, uh, as I alluded to, uh, re-evaluation in people who have um, an exposure to a cardiotoxic agent, really the MRI becomes a, an ideal method because of the very low uh, intercity variability uh, in terms of assessing volumes and fraction, ejection fraction, um, as well as uh, there's always uh, room for assessing patients with uh, arrhythmias, particularly things like VT and frequent BVCs um, that really need to be ruled out in terms of uh, structural heart disease. So I'll conclude here and uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chang. Um. Thank you, Mohan. Let me share my screen with you. Can you see my screen? Um, not from my end, but let me see if our okay. IT guys can see it. Yeah. 
can see it now. You can see it now, correct? Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, today, uh, okay, I'm going uh, to uh, uh, supplement uh, what Maana really talked about, uh, about LB function assessment by product CT. Uh, the reason why uh, LV function could be assessed by cardiac CT is um, if there's any reason we ever want to do it, because we have echo and MRI, we, which are the gold standard and, and, and workhorses that, you know, why would we ever want to do CT is, you know, on some occasion, um, because we are acquiring other part of the cardiac structure, we get information for LV function. And then some very specific in, uh, situation in which uh, neither echo or MRI uh, is, are feasible for patient. Uh, the LBEF could be assessed by CT, and the main reasons are uh, because we uh, we can acquire the LBEF in a single breath hole and you know in certain type of scan or in a single heartbeat. So it could be done in almost everybody. Um, and because of isotropic 3D acquisition and the best spatial resolution and reasonable high temporal resolution and excellent contrast between the LB and myocardium. And it's device friendly, therefore it's completely feasible to do uh, LB, EF and volume quantification by CT. Uh, just some technical issue, just this is um, some of the re other reason uh, why we want to do, we were able to do LB, EF and volume is ECG, ECG gate is just like uh, MRI is, is essential. Um, and then uh, typically we reconstruct from actual images into NPR views of traditional echo of view, uh, apical four, apical long, apical two, and short axis. And then uh, if we acquire multi-phase, we can then play in the scene. And usually the image acquisition protocol with most of the 64 slice uh, detector CT you probably want to use contrast flow rate of four to five cc. If you only want to look at the LV and not the coronary rate, you can use lower injection rate. Uh, and the timing of contrast is standardized to arterial phase and typically about a couple of seconds after time to peak aortic ovocification. And the duration of contrast is roughly about 10 seconds if you have 64 size CT. Obviously, if you have white detector CT or dual source CT, the volume could be much lower. Uh, so this is the traditional granddaddy of the LVEF assessment mode, uh, acquisition mode. Retrospective ECG gating is a helical scan, uh, a lot of overlap. Uh, the X-ray tube is always on. You can get excellent images because you can, you can see here. And we reformat the data set uh, in multiple phases uh, up to about 1.5 millimeter. I would recommend we do at least one millimeter thickness with an overlap uh, with one source, single source CT reconstruct into 10 phases at 10% interval, starting from the unset R wave, you have dual source CT because a little bit better, a much better temporal resolution. You can reconstruct 20 phases or every 5%. And again, using, as uh, I mentioned, reconstruction, uh, multi phase reconstruction, the software can use to play the scene and loop and allow you to see the global uh, LBEF and also regional uh, wall motion. Uh, because of the uh, tube, X ray tube is always on and the pitch is low. Uh, traditionally, is associated with quite high radiation. Uh, so the dose modulation uh, is introduced, essentially doing the systole when the coronary images traditionally are not as good. You can lower the, the tube uh, current about 20% of the maximum, and that could save uh, uh, at least half of the uh, radiation. Um, so that's the traditional way of getting the ejection fraction. Uh, with the prospective gating sequential, we were told that you cannot do that. You cannot assess it yet, but now with the neural scanner, uh, it's, it's capable. Uh, you can uh, uh, choose, for instance, in left-hand side, uh, this prospective gating. You can imagine if I open the window of acquisition or padding, okay, if I start out with ends, 
systole all and systole all the way to the beginning of the diastole. Technically, I could potentially uh, have uh, ejection fraction calculation. Okay, as you can see, this is only part of the cardiac cycle, so the image is kind of choppy, um, but it, it's possible. Uh, whether this is represent um, a bandage over retrospective, it remains to be seen. Uh, technically, you can get the ejection fraction, but unfortunately, if you have arrhythmia, then uh, it could be an issue. The other possible uh, scan mode with helical, with, uh, helical scan mode with our dual source CT, you can do a high pitch helical scan trigger and both and systole, um, and systole and beginning of or end of diastole. And technically, you could just have two uh, sets of images uh, and then acquire, for instance, in the end of that systole uh, over the t at the end of the T wave and right before the R wave or uh, in a diastole. Uh, so obviously you don't have all the information throughout the cardiac cycle, but uh, the radiation doses will be much more uh, uh, forgiving. So what allows CT to, uh, to, 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 to obtain the LV volume and EF calculation? It is because the isotropic reconstructed data. So, so the voxels is, is are a symmetric in all three dimension. So if you have a volume and you can just uh, reconstruct and put in the voxels and you knowing the, the size of your voxel, you get the a volume. So it's a completely 3D uh, calculation. There's no geometric uh, assumption. Having said that, uh, because image quality and how we reconstruct images, you can do the 2D or Simpson methods like MRI. Uh, and, and, and this will be a case. It's a little more tedious. You need to go in there and, uh, and trace the contour. You can, in this case, we include the pop muscle into the left ventricle, but you can also take long, you know, take your time and go around this uh, pop muscle. Uh, or you can do just do area length method to the uh, 3D threshold basis a lot more uh, uh, more automated. Basically, it follows uh, uh, because of the high attenuation difference between the myocardial and contrast allows this this, this algorithm to work. Uh, essentially, follow the the different follow the contra high Hounsfield unit uh, in the LV cavity. And, um, and stop where uh, the lower Hounsfield unit, the myocardium, that's how you determine the, the, the water. So, uh, but realistically, most of the time, also the software we use incorporates some type of AI uh, algorithm, although we don't realize it. And uh, this is just an example, obviously. I'm not going to talk about how the AI uh, algorithm works because I don't know <laughs> at all. This is a very, you know, crew understanding of, of it. But essentially, you know, uh, uh, they, have a uh, they, they have a training set, several hundred patients, which a, 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 a trained uh, uh, technician takes one to two hours for each case to trace the contour and then, and then, uh, go through multiple iteration computational uh, software. Uh, so it allows you to basically come out with a deep learning, machine learning model to apply to the images that are acquired. So you can see here, uh, it's a, uh, you come out with, when you're uh, sending your DICON data set, you can have a predictive segment, segmentation mask and the contour uh, it displays and some, it could allow some, uh, Operator interface to adjust if, if uh, you think that the water didn't work very well. So essentially, just giving you some example, a workflow is when you load all the faces in the correct cycle, uh, you get these images, you get the segmentation. Okay, so this is all AI based. And after that, uh, 
for instance, here, you can have either contour, including the, including the palm muscle, or in this case, excluding the palm muscle. And therefore, right ventricle, uh, most of the software cannot, uh, does, does not exclude any uh, non-blood non -blood structure inside the cavity. Okay, so when you do 3D methods or threshold based or AI plus uh, threshold based versus 2D, you can see, I mean, it's quite similar, okay? What's the caveat? The 2D, the problem obviously require a lot of user interface. It's time consuming, um, just like what you guys do the MRI, you have to go in and trace it. And, um, and so there's some systematic error where you put your plane and so on and so forth, essentially where the base and the apex. And essentially, and most importantly, you know, you have some arrhythmia, basically, this is going to be very uh, damage, uh, damaging to, to the result. And 3D, the problem you require homogeneous orthopedic classification, LV, and greater difference than 150 difference attenuation value, it'll be it will be Lumen compared to the myocardium. AI kind of solved the problem. Uh, in most of the cases, you know, we're working on some study and it really works quite well, even in study uh, with suboptimal contrast. So what is uh, the correlation between the MRI derived volume and EF compared to CTA? As you can imagine, both have excellent spatial resolution and correlation. As you it's no surprise, it's, 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 it's as good as you get. Um, as this one small study compared to 3DT, echo, CT, and MRI. And, uh, and the key here is, I think, it's, again, shouldn't be surprising because the image quality is the variability of the measurement is about only half of the real time 3D echo. I'm sure with the newer 3D echo, this, this could be a little bit less. Um, but uh, overall, again, one, one other point is CT overestimate the volume and systolic and diastolic volume because the temporal resolution limitation, but ejection fraction is only slightly less. Okay. So this is what I was talking about. CT understands. The EF because the lower temporal resolution and overestimate uh, uh, and systolic volume. Uh, that's explanation. Usually, systole is only 300 milliseconds, and the minimal volume is, is up 10 between 80 to 200 milliseconds. So, if you have a temporal resolution of 65 milliseconds, which is the best we have, or 250 in some of the 64 slices, it's literally it's impossible to catch exactly the smallest volume or end systolic volume. Uh, so this is a take home message, compare the CMR echo, overestimate, yeah, but we know that, and CT usually underestimate the ejection fraction by about 5%. Okay, the other question, the other issue that sometimes come out is, does it make any difference if you reconstruct every 5% or 20 phases? or 10 phases. You know, visually, uh, it, it's very little, the difference is not very big, but you can see it's a lot smoother, the display uh, and the curve looks better. And you can see the volume here, the end systolic, end diastolic volume of 10 to 20 phases is 208 versus 178. And uh, end systolic volume is 82, and this end systolic volume is 70. Uh, so, but overall, ejection fraction is, you know, 60, 61%, so it's very similar. So it's really now, I personally think, in a very regular rhythm and slow heart rate, uh, I think either two fa 10 phases or 20 phases doesn't make a huge difference. But if the patient heart rate is a little bit faster, 20 phases could offer a little bit more accuracy. So clinically, uh, five less than 5% difference, I don't think it make any uh, management difference. Okay. Next question is when you, when you exclude the palm muscle or should you include the palm muscle? So this is the same patient as you can see right here. Again, one, we got 61%, 80, 58%. Uh, we include the palm muscle, obviously, 
the and that solid volume is going to be higher. Um, but the, you know, but again, um, the the ejection fraction is slightly lower um, because and that solid volume is is higher. Uh, and so is in systolic volume. Other caveats is uh, when you get beta blocker for a coronary angiography assess coronary uh, artery assessment, it could technically affect the LV volume and ejection fraction. And other caveats of using CT for assessment of LV here, obviously, we require uh, radiation and, and, and contrast. Okay. Other consideration is, is type of scanner affect assessment of LVEF. I think it does. As you can see right here, uh, most of the 64 slices uh, CT scanner will require six to eight, six to 10 seconds to acquire the images. Um, uh, with the white detector CT, you require one single heartbeat. Uh, so, so the difference is with the white detector CT, you eliminate the motion artifact and, and this arrhythmia. Um, but the temporal resolution, spatial resolution is completely uniform. As you can see here, all the step artifact coming from uh, going, you know, acquiring multiple stacks versus one single rotation, everything is uniform. What you see here is exactly the same time as what's happening right here. Whether here is earlier, you know, and here is the bottom part of the R with regular 64 size CT, uh, this happens six to eight seconds later, okay? So with this uh, white detector CT technology, you can obtain a very accurate LV ejection fraction, even a patient with atrial fibrillation, because uh, you can acquire you know, single B acquisition, open another window and get uh, a true LV and systolic volume and that's a volume and calculate the ejection fraction. Uh, uh, different from MRI, there's not much, there's much less uh, normal reference value. Uh, this is one of the few studies that uh, look at uh, uh, from um, New York when Dr. Mean was still in Cornell. Uh, they look at healthy, technically, quote unquote, healthy adults. There's no without hypertension or obesity. Um, and this is the, you know, the volume they obtain. And you can see, I'll just give you an example. Um, this is index and mass. So the LV by 3D method, just a fraction is 64%. And systolic volume is about 52 per meter square. And diastolic volume is about 143. I'm sorry, 70, 76, 76 uh, cc per, per, per meter square. And that, HM, the mean HM is 86 with the index of 46. Uh, so that, and, and with 3D methods, I mean, so, so normal, normal index volume is 54 per meter squared. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot higher and larger than um, what we get, the number that we use in echo. But again, this is similar to MI. So besides LV ejection fraction, uh, what other function of parameter can we derive from a uh, CT data set? And this is a parametric display of the case that I showed you earlier. Uh, actually, it will be this case. Okay. So this is a case. And you can have a parametric display, essentially a wall thickness. And, and diastole and wall thickness and, and the system, okay? So red means thicker. So overall, you can see, and this is the wall thickening. And, you know, in the actual software, if you point your cursor in the region, this is the 17 segments, uh, and it will tell you what percentage fraction is shortening of each segment, okay? And this always, all, obviously only works if you have a, a you know, good to excellent image quality. Uh, but uh, this is a clinical case. A uh, patient we saw about a couple of weeks ago in CT lab, 57 year old, works in the hospital, coming with chest pain, uh, 
in short of breath, you can see a very tight LED lesion uh, involving uh, the origin of the diagonal right, right here. And this is a corresponding LV uh, uh, coronary angiogram, very tight lesion, she extended the well. Uh, so what, you know, what else? Okay, I think there's a lot more we can get. We happen to acquire the images in metastole and in systole. You can see even with two, uh, two, uh, two phase, uh, we were able to get wall motion, uh, detect the wall motion abnormality. You can see the extensive whole anterior wall, the septum, the apex, it's not moving. And you can, so this is for, for us, we're able to detect the regional wall motion. And we also able to detect some perfusion, resting perfusion abnormality. This is a part of metric display of the perfusion. You can see focus mostly in anterior wall. This is mostly probably due to attenuation in the inferior wall. And this is a parametric display, hybrid display between the LB uh, and geography and the perfusion. And give you an idea that this area mostly is affected from the proximal LAD lesion affecting the, the first diagonal and second diagonal. And this is just a, a binary display of the perfusion. So why is this important? And this, again, I mean, how, how feasible is this? And this has been done almost 15 years ago. Uh, using 54 slide CT in patient with, a, with acute chest pain um, compared to echo the, and the CT overall good correlation, very good correlation, just global adjustment for action, uh, very pretty good, I would say pretty good correlation for regional wall motion assessment between CT and echo and, and fair correlation between um, perfusion abnormality by CT and, and spec infarct size. So this is feasible. And in addition, there is incremental va pronostic value of uh, severity of coronary disease and EF. This is not surprising. Any imaging modality will get you that. Uh, but it's important uh, to, uh, to know that in this Romicat study, the pronostic value of CT uh, is, is enhanced if you incorporate a regional wall motion abnormality. So what do I mean by that? For instance, if, if you have patients have stenosis and no, and no regional wall motion abnormality, obviously the prognosis is not as good compared to a patient without coronary stenosis. But if you have both stenosis and more but regional wall motion, the prognosis is even worse. Again, not too surprising, but again, you, if you have your know, CT data set, uh, it's important to, to report that. Okay, just real quickly through some other, you know, just kind of show and tell what CT could be used in certain situation for RBEF assessment. As you can see here, patient with LBAT, uh, not surprising, uh, RB. Image quality is not that good. CT with reasonable image quality, we are able to calculate the section fraction by measuring diastolic volume and systolic volume. Okay. And then this is the previous case that I showed you earlier. Patient had, you know, mitral regurgitation and the absence of tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary regurgitation and aortic regurgitation. So basically, you can I calculate the regurgitating volume by subtracting the, the RV uh, stroke volume from LV stroke volume. You can get a regurgitating uh, volume, in this case, about 45 or 50 cc. Okay. Uh, and then and it's also feasible to calculate, to assess diastolic uh, function. So just briefly, this is, a little bit, and I think it's quite ingenious. So essentially, you can track the volume through the cardiac cycle, the time volume curve. Okay, so if you if you calculate the difference between the two phases, okay, the difference that's how much what's the volume of the blood going to going. Passing through um, the mitral valve 
through that target phase. So if you have a, you can re reconstruct a mitral inflow pattern, just like echo, if you have the mitral valve area, right? Same thing you can also measure. You, you, put, a, you put your vision interest in the annulus and apex. You can measure the distance between systole and diastole and the difference converted will be the velocity. So you have time and you have distance. So, so, so with that, you can essentially uh, calculate the transmitral velocity and the mitral septal tissue velocity, and, and that's being correlated with echo. A little bit tedious, it's easier to get an echo, but just to, you know, maybe may useful for uh, research uh, in certain population, for instance, we're interested in, in doing this, apply to the right ventricle in patient with LVAT, for instance. And obviously with a, such a good image quality, spectral tracking is possible. Uh, and there's already commercially available a software for assessment of the strain it has been correlated with MRI and, and, and echo as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail. This is fairly new. We personally don't have any experience, but uh, we, we recently, uh, with Dr. Deepan Shah's support, we're hoping to get the software and uh, we can start doing some of this analysis. Uh, I think most excitingly is uh, one of the things that I'm interested in the left atrial function assessment. So, you know, the, the left atrial function add, is, add a lot of pronounced information on top of the maximum volume and with CT, you can you know, come up with the volume changes. You can get the uh, diastolic atrial volume, uh, emptying volume, um, stroke volume, uh, emptying fractions. And right now with the new software, you can also do the global strain uh, or reservoir strain. So a lot of opportunity for future research. Okay, my last slide is in conclusion, volume and EF assessment by CTA are feasible and accurate. It provides additional prognostic information to the coronary artery uh, disease severity. And for a patient who, who are difficult to image by echo or unable to do the MRI, specific assessment of right ventricular function morphology, such as ill back patient, CT could be considered. And I think it's important for us to get some regional wall motion information where, especially in patients with acute chest pain, and remember you do not need to get do the retrospective gating protocol, which involves a lot of radiation. You can use either uh, several uh, um, high pitch mode, or you can do uh, white padding with your white detector CT and you can get some information of the regional wall motion. And that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. It's open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Chang. So we have one question. How do you use the volume numbers in real life? Do you have a range that you have in mind? Thanks. So I would say, at least from, from our end, we, we, we want to also determine, first we want to determine normality. You know, is the person's heart normal or abnormal? And uh, really, for the vast majority of patients getting an MRI scan, they would have had an echo done that had something um, that led to the person uh, getting an MRI. So first is clarification and identifying, you know, true normality versus true abnormality. And I would say, you know, very often we use the volumes as a secondary check. For example, in cases with valve disease, um, if I get an, an end diastolic volume of the LV um, that's similar to the RV in a patient with severe MR, I know that there's something uh, wrong because the, the LV volume should be significantly larger than the RV volume. Um, we use those as secondary checks, for example, when we're uh, comparing the forward stroke volumes um, uh, compared to the stroke volumes and um, those really help us uh, very often in, in those valve cases. Um, another application is athlete's heart where these people actually have now established uh, thresholds for what's considered to be normal and abnormal 
And in terms of a range, I would refer you to that guideline document which was updated this last year from SCMR. Generally, once your index EDV is upper, greater than 90 to 100, it becomes you know, abnormal or in general considered to be mildly enlarged. Once it's gre one greater than uh, 125 uh, mLs per meter squared, that's moderately enlarged. And once you get to greater than 150, uh, that's generally considered to be severely enlarged. Whereas on echo, for example, uh, remember, you know, a greater than 100 can sometimes be considered severely enlarged, uh, particularly for women. Uh, Dr. Cheng, do you have? Yeah, well, CT, as I said, there's no, not that much, almost not very few, you know, reference table was used, but uh, not from the literature, I guess we could potentially use the reference number from the CMR, yeah. but as if now we don't report uh, the volume or mass just because we certainly don't have the reference value, but we see something that's grossly abnormal, we'll report it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, but we do a report ejection fraction if we have both n systolic and diastolic of volume, yeah. yeah. You wonder if it will become uh, mandated in CT reports, uh, you know, with these improvements in scanner technology and AI algorithms of getting all these values done automatically. Maybe well, uh, currently, yeah, it's almost quasi-automatic. I mean, yeah. the reason, reasonable image quality, you, you could foresee, you know, some uh, software tweak, uh, whatever number you get. Uh, uh, we can cur currently the software for calcium score assessment, for, you know, for chamber segmentation is, is readily available. You can you can, you know, you can envision the day that everything was done automatically and it could be automatic transfer to the to the report and with the reference value in it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, that'll save a lot of time. Okay, any questions from the audience here? Okay, well, it looks like we're, we're done. We'll see you guys next Tuesday. All right, thank you all. Thank you.